to the third day. Uh, so welcome to the third session of the uh, Terra Incognita meeting. Thank you all again for uh, being here at these different time zones. And today we will uh, dive a little bit deeper into how to bridge MRI and microscopy. Now, unlike uh, the other introductions, I decided not to provide uh, an overview of a fantastically interesting field, but to give you a little bit more insight into uh, what it entails to uh, process human brain tissue uh, for several aspects of uh, studying the subcortex. I'll however start uh, with some housekeeping. Uh, I would like to remind you of the uh, setup of the session. Uh, first, I will provide an introduction and then we have three excellent invited presentations. Uh, the uh, presenters are invited to uh, talk for 30 minutes each, after which we have room for questions, discussions, and potentially a break. And it worked really well, I thought, yesterday to ask the questions via the chat channel. So let's uh, stick to that. So moving on to science then. Uh, for me, this whole adventure started uh, many years ago when uh, we decided actually on a terrace here in Amsterdam uh, to count how many structures were actually named in the uh, uh, nomenclature of the uh, anatomical federation uh, in, in the subcortex. And we found that of these 455 structures that we counted, a disappointing 7% was mapped in MRI atlases. And we decided to dive a little bit uh, into that further because we thought that this number was actually slightly disappointing. So we made an overview uh, on uh, uh, which structures were there and uh, we wanted to get a better handle on why the coverage was so low. And we wanted to know which of the structures were actually missing. So we made an overview and we found that, of course, there were a large number of small structures that were missing, uh, including very small structures such as uh, sub parts of the uh, geniculate uh, bodies of the uh, metathalamus. So some really small uh, anatomical features which you can question whether you really need them in your atlasing efforts of MRI. And some of these really small structures may not be needed or wanted in an MRI atlas. But despite this, um, it remains that many interesting structures that can be targeted in MRI research were still lacking from these uh, atlases. And the question then became, how much better can we do and how should we go about this? Improvement of in vivo imaging techniques is of course a logical way to go. And another possibility is to make use of post-mortem human brain material, as well as the combination with microscopy approaches. So many groups around the world have realized that uh, there are different approaches that can provide us with complementary information. And uh, that meaningful information can be gained by combining a number of these techniques. So classically, this was done by just comparison uh, through literature. But nowadays, many groups try to take this one step further and create research pipelines that allow the combination of postmortem and in vivo results to be registered into a common MRI space. And that allows a more direct uh, comparison of the research data. Now, what I want to do here is uh, to share some secrets of the trade. And uh, this means that I will uh, share a lot of uh, our own images because a lot of the processing of the tissue for microscopy doesn't end actually end up in the literature. So here uh, you can see that in the thalamus, the human thalamus, for instance, you can get wonderful contrast using uh, basic histological staining, such as the Bilshawski silver staining here or a little bit more advanced immunocytochemical techniques. And uh, what we and other groups uh, try to do is we try to combine ultra high field MRI uh, with subsequent uh, autopsy of the tissue after which we cut the brain 
we take it apart and then we try to reconstruct it. And through this uh, method, we can actually create histological and uh, immunocytochemical amounts, uh, accounts of the same brain that we have scanned also with MRI. So this is really bridging across these disciplines. Now, what you don't read if you read these uh, uh, studies on human postmortem brains is the challenges that you face. And uh, I noticed this also yesterday when we saw these beautiful data from chimpanzees. Uh, chimpanzees also uh, don't die the way that rodents die in the lab. These are not healthy specimens. So what you deal with is often a limited number of observation, which has to do with the availability of the material, but also with the labor intensive nature of the work. And then, of course, you deal with a lot of confounders in postmortem tissue that you simply cannot control. And these are uh, age, sex, agonal state, the medication that these patients uh, received before they died, factors like seasonal and circadian variation. You don't know in what part of the year people have died. There can be lateralization uh, uh, effects. Often researchers don't have a whole brain to their uh, uh, research, but they have to work with parts and usually parts from one hemisphere. There can be a family history that we don't know about. And post-mortem, we of course have to deal with things like the time between the demise of the person and then until we can actually start fixating the, uh, uh, the brain itself. There's large variations in the brain weight. Uh, the pH of the brain changes when you die People, of course, vary in the way they die, when they die, and how the tissue is treated. These methods are often standardized, but still variation can occur. But again, uh, using postmortem uh, uh, tissue, it also has advantages. As you can see here, you can uh, scan with a high level of detail. And this is in part because you can scan for a very long time. And these beautiful images uh, were created at the Max Planck Institute using the MPM scans uh, of Nick uh, Weisskopf. And uh, Evgenia was uh, <laughs> very much involved in uh, acquiring these images together with uh, uh, other people such as Karen Pine. Now, what we do after we scan the tissue, we scan in the skull, uh, we actually start mistreating the tissue. And this is what a lot of anatomists do severely. For instance, when you do the autopsy, we already get these artifacts in. We start cutting the brain uh, in ways we didn't want to. Now, I think that uh, in this crowd, I am forgiven that we damage the cortex a little bit. I can tell you the subcortex is still very much intact in this brain. And then after that, we do these crazy things. We start freezing the brain which cannot be good for tissue integrity either. Uh, now we do this uh, while freezing the brain, uh, but if we compare to other approaches such as big brain in which formalin fixation and paraffin embedding uh, is used as the main technique, these changes also occur. For instance, there can be something on the knife which will rip all of your tissue. And working with 20 micron thick sections, you can imagine how fragile this tissue is. And that is apart from deformation that occurs, for instance, due to the uh, paraffin embedding, uh, which can also shrink the tissue. So these are all things that uh, uh, people reconstructing 3D brains have to deal with. Uh, so I can tell you uh, how we deal uh, with this. Let me see if this runs. No. Unfortunately, it does. Oh, there it goes. Uh, so what you see here is we create for uh, registration purposes, block face images. And what we do is every time we cut a slice, we take an image of the tissue block. And this allows us to not register, but restack these data. And that gives us a 2D to 2D problem, just like uh, Juan Ige, uh, Eugenio Iglesias explained yesterday, and that facilitates the registration already. So I think I will let this run because I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will uh, want to look at their uh, favorite structure. 
So soon we'll see the subthalamic nucleus popping up together with the uh, uh, substantia nigra. And then later on, you can identify the locus ceruleus as well as here is the SN. And here is your substantia nigra. And in the end, we can see the locus ceruleus as well as the deep cerebellar nuclei. And if we wait a little bit here, we'll soon see the uh, uh, locus ceruleus popping up. Here we go. You can see it running here in black. And then we can start seeing the dentate here, for instance, and the other deep cerebellar nuclei. So this is how we uh, create the block phase images. But what you don't see is that these are images that we take uh, and every time we take this image, we cut a section. And these sections are then processed for uh, immunohistochemistry or uh, immunocytochemical techniques. And this is not a pretty site either. So what you see here is uh, the digital system that we use for acquiring the imaging. And we also uh, handle the, we, we operate the cutting machine with this. So you will see the image move. And that is because I'm trying to both collect uh, tissue as well as making a movie and that will look a little bit wobbly. So here you can see we take a picture. These are the specifics of the machine. We cut at 200 micron and then the machine starts moving. So this is the block we take the picture of. You can see the section rolling off and there's a very sharp knife there that I shouldn't touch. And that is the section we use for creating microscopy images. And we store these at minus 20 so we let them fall in these little urine jars. And I think you can appreciate uh, from this movie what we do to the tissue. And it's not pretty. The cool thing is that in the end, it becomes pretty again. And here you see exactly the same sections on the left, but now we've uh, rolled them out again and we've processed them and we've done uh, staining in this case for uh, calbindin and uh, uh, calretinin, and you can appreciate how much of the quality is still there in the tissue. So we are uh, uh, mean to the tissue, but it is strong enough to survive this. And the same holds, of course, with the different uh, type of treatment. For, for instance, the Big Brain Project, in which the tissue is paraffin embedded and treated like that. So using these techniques, and then coming from the uh, in vivo uh, uh, MRI scanning via post-mortem MRI, uh, I think that we can create a wonderful bridge with complementary information. And we've done this uh, uh, as well as big brain through histological and uh, immunocytochemical stainings. But imagine what else you could do if you uh, combine information uh, from uh, connectivity profiles with post-mortem, via post-mortem MRI with detailed imaging, such as the polarized uh, light imaging. To me, this sounds like the sky is the limit and we have a very exciting future. Uh, and many groups uh, in the world are of course working on this and each with their different approaches. And we can all, uh, you know, start incorporating uh, the nicest, uh, parts of each individual pipeline to come to an even better pipeline. And uh, people working at uh, different aspects of this type of pipeline uh, will hopefully share their knowledge with us today and uh, will learn us a bit more on how we can improve and use these type of data even further. So today we have three awesome speakers. We have Evgenia Kirilina, we have Carla, Carla Miller and we have uh, Matan Khan. And with that, I would like to invite Evgenia to start sharing her screen and uh, uh, let us know what she's been working on. <laughs> 